This is our warrior cry to the world. We are not drowning, we are fighting. For generations, our connection to the land, ocean, and sky has been one of respect. <laughs> With a tradition of taking only what we need, following in the footsteps of our ancestors. Over in the Republic of the Marshall Islands, my fellow warriors remind me of what can happen when we disrupt the natural balance of the earth. Already battling with the climate crisis, they are now facing the additional threat of toxic nuclear waste seeping into their waters. Another example of how big countries can destroy little islands. Chicken <laughs> The Marshall Islands have been at the forefront of climate action. In 2019, they became the first country to declare a national climate crisis. Some parts are so thin, you can stand in the middle of the road and there's ocean on either side of you. We're only two meters above sea level. That's about a little over six feet, which means that we're really low lying. Even just 20 inches of sea level rise makes a huge impact. This atoll nation is no stranger to facing the damage caused by global superpowers. Between 1946 and 1958, the USA began to test nuclear weapons in the Marshall Islands. And even today, the locals are still dealing with nuclear fallout. We have some of the highest cancer rates in the world. Massive increase of birth defects from Marshallese women giving birth to what they call jellyfish babies because they didn't realize that, you know, the poison from all of those nuclear weapons impacted their bodies. seen as a sacrificial zone. Let's test nuclear weapons in this country because it's a country in the middle of nowhere. In the middle of nowhere to whom? <laughs> and then it's the same thing with climate change. Why should we have to be, yet again, another sacrificial zone? We've already lost islands, and now we're about to lose more because of the climate crisis. And then you've got Runa Dome. They took one of the islands that was obliterated and turned into a crater. They shoveled a bunch of nuclear waste on it, capped it with a concrete dome, and now, because of the rising sea level, that concrete dome is leaking nuclear waste into the Pacific Ocean. So Runit Dome is the perfect metaphor for the intersection between climate and nuclear issues. As the sea level rises and further cracks Runit Dome, the nuclear waste will increasingly devastate marine life. The nuclear waste will also make its way up the food chain to be in the seafood that Marshallese people depend on. This specific nation has a history of environmental justice advocacy. Kathy walks the path that Darlene Keju Johnson blazed. 
an activist from Ebay known for tearing down the curtain of silence around nuclear history in the Pacific. My island that is up in the north is also contaminated. I too have three tumors in me. Darlene also pioneered a legacy of art and activism, using music to bring attention to issues facing her people. Where Darlene chose song, Kathy has chosen poetry to ring the alarm on climate justice. Dear Mata Filipino, don't cry. Mommy promises you no one will come and devour you. No greedy whale of a company sharking through political seas. No backwater bullying of businesses with broken morals. No blindfolded bureaucracies gonna push this mother ocean over the edge. No one's drowning, baby. No one's moving. No one's losing their homeland. No one's becoming a climate change refugee. Or should I say, no one else. Okay, is that your fruit, your water bottle? I think that's everything. So what I always tell people is, I didn't know how to speak to world leaders, but I had my daughters, so I thought I'll just write a letter to my daughter, you know, because I would want her to know that there's all these people who are trying to fight on climate change and who are doing all the work. So the poem, that's what the poem became. It was about, it was, and I always tell people it's one of my most hopeful poems. The first time I met Kathy was back at a COP climate summit in Paris back in 2015. Try to scare them, you're gonna try to be- hopeful. Many people outside the climate space won't know about this global conference and how the Pacific has to fight for ambitious climate goals to be included in the agreement. The Paris one especially was so overwhelming. Was that your first cop? Yeah. Was that yours? Yes. Yes, it was. Yeah. COP is short for Conference of the Parties, and basically this is an international annual meeting on climate change. All the countries come together to meet on the Paris Treaty and talk about global obligations to addressing climate crisis. We've been holding the line long before COP existed, so it's important that we continue to do so and continue to hold our ground. From this conference emerged the Paris Agreement, a symbol of hope for our climate-vulnerable communities. This is a pivotal agreement rallying all nations to pursue efforts to limit global temperature rise to well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, with a striving effort to cap it at 1.5 degrees. The science is clear. Anything higher than 1.5 would mean the end for our small island states and low-lying atoll nations. And for Marshallese, enough is enough. There was this massive social media campaign where all of these Marshallese youth came out with this photo, 1.5 to stay alive. It was really powerful. We get to Paris, we're in the meetings, we're getting ready to negotiate the treaty. I've never been to a cop, but I am hearing from folks, 1.5 isn't gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. But somehow, our minister was able to gather some of the biggest leaders together and convince them to keep 1.5 in the treaty. And so they got 1.5 in the treaty. By championing the 1.5 degree target and rallying support from other small island states and developing nations, the Marshall Islands helped boost ambition of the agreement emphasizing the urgent call for greater climate resilience and mitigation efforts. Back home on Majuro, locals recognized they needed to speed up their adaptation efforts. The prospect of big nations reducing their emissions isn't promising enough for the survival of these coral atolls. They have had to look to adaptation as their reality, we were forced to change our focus to adaptation because we knew that the climate impacts, they're coming down the pipeline, they're gonna be bad, they're gonna be massive, and we needed to start planning for it now and we need to start protecting ourselves now. From not just advocating internationally for folks to lower their carbon emissions, but also shifted internally. 
and protect it in a way that fits in line with our culture and with our own values. So that means engaging communities, getting their perspectives about what kinds of adaptation they want to see. Do they want to leave? Do they want to stay? Do they want to lift up islands? Do they want to relocate to another island? I worked as one of the consultants going out into the communities and doing surveys and trying to understand what the people are going through. It's weird that we need to have a survival plan, like <laughs> just thinking about it. But yeah, a lot of the work that we do right now is just spreading awareness about the adaptation plan and making sure that each member of the community knows what's happening, all the elders who can't speak English, trying to make sure that the language is accessible for all these different people. Youth group Jojikum are continuing the fight for climate justice by empowering the next generation of Marshallese to address the impacts of climate change on their atoll. Jojigo means your home or your place, but it's also an acronym which stands for which means youth who help the land that is green and lush. We're going to go around the room and we're going to say a color that reflects how we feel this morning. Our main focus is spreading awareness and making sure that the youth are aware of climate change, not just the effects and the causes, but also like the science behind it why it's happening and what it means for us as the next generation of the Marshall Islands. Either or, either the mural or the runway, we'll need a really strong team. You can set aside a, a task. We have different programs, like a three-day after-school workshop with high school students. We teach them about the importance of phasing out of fossil fuels. Also, we have the Climate Change and Health Arts Seminar which happens every summer. We gather high schoolers from all the high schools around Mejuro and also some of the neighboring islands, and we teach them about the effects of climate change on health, our mental health, how it affects food security and all the diseases that come with the changing in the weather patterns, how it affects our culture even, and what that means for us. Climate change effects come in all shapes and sizes. In addition to visible physical loss, the people of Marshall Islands are also dealing with cultural loss. One tradition that is quickly slipping away is weaving, a vital part of Marshallese culture for thousands of years. The women here are renowned as some of the finest weavers in the Pacific. You <laughs>
kartu ini. Oh, pemian tambah camping, cina ler, cina ler. Living on a low coral island, it's close to the sea. You can feel the trade winds. You can see the green. Live, living. This is Kalalian, 30 years ago, and uh, this is where we're standing right here. Now that you are on the island, is this part is gone? This part is gone. We lost up to 30 meters, not feet meter. So, I don't know, most of the people, my neighbors, they say, just fork at it. That is mean you'll have to fork at your way of living, your birth rights and everything that you own. You, you never can fork at that. I, I never can fork at that. But not me. I don't want to move. 